guys for joining us today for the All Bugs Good and Bad webinar series. Um, before we get started, if you'll just notice that we have a chat box, if you have questions or, or a comment during the webinar, you can go ahead and type those in. And thank you, Dr. Tim Davis and Vicki Bertinelli from Clinton Cooperative Extension and University of Georgia Extension for taking care of those questions for us. There's also a question and answer box at the bottom. When we get finished, we'll have time for, for a few questions if you have one for our speaker. And for our speaker, Ms. Wizzy Brown, thank you so much for joining us today. She is the Integrated Pest Management Program Specialist from Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And she's covering a, a pretty difficult topic today as she's gonna talk about structural misidentified pests. So Ms. Wizzy, thank you for coming today. Thank you very much. All right, so we are gonna jump right in. So the first one, and I have been getting this one recently, I am in Texas, so we have been getting a lot of rain recently. And I keep getting calls and questions on worms moving into the house. And usually they're not worms coming into the house. So millipedes are typically what people are calling to ask about. And these are some pictures of millipedes. When you look at a millipede to tell the difference, you are going to look for a pair of antennae. So there is a single pair of antennae. They have a head. They have a long worm-like body. They also have four legs on each of their body segments. Their body is also more rounded in shape, which will tell them apart from uh, one that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. But with millipedes, these are typically gonna be found in an outside environment, which is where they're supposed to be, and that's perfectly great when they are. Um, but a lot of times they will move indoors when it gets cold or when it gets really, really wet outside or when it gets really hot and dry outside. They will work their way into structures. And usually what happens is they will end up dying because they don't have enough moisture to survive indoors. And so when people come across them inside, they're a lot of times going to be curled up in this spiral shape that you see up here in the right, because this is typically what happens when they die, but they may also curl up into a spiral like that when you are poking at them or something, because that's how they protect themselves. So that is what a millipede looks like, and they are often confused with the one on the top picture, which is a centipede. And these look very similar. We're going to talk more about them in a few minutes. But general difference here is it has a more flattened body shape. And they have two legs on every segment of their body. And then the other one, of course, is the one on the bottom. That is an earthworm. And they do not have legs. And they do not have antennae. And they're also kind of slimy if you touch them. But a lot of people don't want to touch the stuff that comes into their house. And, you know, that's... That's their choice and that's perfectly fine. All right, so centipedes. These are going to be very similar to the millipedes. Um, they are both myriapods. And so they're gonna have a pair of antennae as well. They have the head, they have that long worm-like body. But if you look closely at these, they only have two legs on every segment of their body. And there are a variety of centipedes that you can find, a um, variety of millipedes for that matter as well. Um, but you can see the three pictures here. These are all centipedes and these are all very different. So the one on the left is one that's typically found outdoors and these are gonna be smaller in size. So these only get maybe inch, inch and a half or so when they're fully grown. Um, but in some parts of the United States, we have the bottom picture right here, and these ones can get about nine inches when they're fully grown. So they can be a rather uh, startling thing to come across when you have them come in your house. And usually the report that I get about these is that when people go to shower in the morning, they have these stuck in the shower or the bathtub. 
And usually what happens there is they're coming in, they're looking for a source of moisture. And if you think about the, the shower pan or the bathtub, they have smooth sides. And so when they go down in there to get the moisture, they can't get back out because they can't climb up that smooth surface. So they end up getting stuck. And it's a, um, I guess, a really good way to wake you up in the morning, good in the sense that you're then very awake, um, but not good in the sense of, you know, kind of easing into your day. And then we have the one on the upper right hand side that is known as a house centipede. And those ones can sometimes be found indoors. And if you see them inside, they are a good creature to have inside, kind of like geckos, because they will help to reduce the insects that you may have crawling around inside because these are predators. They're going to feed on insects and other arthropods. And a lot of times the house centipedes will be feeding on things like cockroaches. So um, depending upon how you feel about different things, I know a lot of people that really, really hate cockroaches. And so they would be fine with having this in there. But then I know other people that they think they have way too many legs and they look too creepy and you know they, they don't want those or the cockroaches in their house. So those are centipedes. Remember antennae, long worm like body, two legs on each body segment. So just very similar to the millipedes. The mistaken identipede, uh, identity here are going to be confusing them again with earthworms. But remember the earthworms do not have antennae. They do not have legs. And then mistaking them with the millipedes. So those are gonna have antennae, but they have a more rounded body and they're gonna have four legs on every segment of their body. And please do not panic about that millipede that is on my hand in that picture because that is a giant African millipede. We don't have millipedes that get that big in the United States. All right, this is the next one, bed bugs. I get lots and lots of questions about stuff and people think if they find it on their bed, it must be a bed bug, regardless of what it is. So bed bugs. They are true bugs. They are going to have piercing, sucking mouth parts. So on the underside of their body, it's going to look like a soda straw. That is what they stab into you to suck the blood out. They do have a pair of antennae. They have six legs. But the thing that usually throws people off with bed bugs is that they don't have any wings. And that is essentially in all forms. Usually insects that are in the same order will not have wings in the immature stages, but in the adult stage they do. With bed bugs, that is not the case. Bed bugs are gonna have no wings in every life stage. And basically that's because they are going to live in close association with their host. So they don't really need those wings to disperse really long distances to find mates or food or anything like that because their food is right next door. So you can see that there are some pictures of bed bugs here. There is one next to a dime to kind of give you a size reference of how large an adult bed bug is. There's also the ruler that shows the different stages of a bed bugs. So you can see that they do come in a varying range of sizes. And then there's the mattress up there that shows the fecal spotting, the blood stains, the cast skins, the bed bugs, and all that good stuff. So that, of course, was a very severe infestation. So mistaken identity here. These are some of the common culprits. I'm sure that there are others that I am missing, but the first one is the one on the left-hand side, <clears throat> excuse me, and that is a carpet beetle. So these are small oval-shaped beetles and since they are beetles, they have their front wings that are hardened into what we call an elytra. And they also are going to have their body covered in scales. And for this particular carpet beetle, you can see that those scales actually are different colors. And so it has a kind of mottled color appearance. If you were to flip this over and look closely at it, you would see that these actually have chewing mouth parts. And carpet beetles, you know, generally for the adults, I, I tend to see 
carpet beetles in people's homes here in Texas because the adults are going to be feeding on pollen and a lot of times they'll feed on crepe myrtles and people like to plant those crepe myrtles near the house and so they end up finding their way indoors and they're not sucking blood they're not going to be a problem the immature carpet beetles on the other hand can be an issue but not in the part of being problematic sucking human blood that doesn't happen with them the immature carpet beetles will feed on protein items which i know blood is protein but these are like pet hair they'll feed on wool they're they'll feed on uh, feathers things like that so i'll see them a lot of times in areas that have wool carpets or rugs or uh, taxidermied animals or um you know anything with feathers um sometimes leather so any of those type of items i've also seen them a lot of people say well how can i have carpet beetles if i don't have carpeting i have seen houses that have hardwood floors but they have animals and that animal hair collects along the edges of surfaces and those carpet beetles can feed on that animal hair and so you can sustain a population that way on the right hand side of this slide we see a cockroach nymph or an immature and i i love cockroaches i know a lot of people don't like them um, but these are often mistaken for bed bugs because sometimes we can get cockroaches coming inside the house and the immatures kind of look similar to bed bugs i guess but these are going to have much longer antennae if you look at them they're going to have a broadly joined thorax, which is the second section of the insect behind the head, and then the abdomen, which is the third section of the body. So that thorax and abdomen are going to be broadly joined. Whereas if you look at bed bugs, if we go back, you can see how it is kind of constricted. So you have your head, you have your thorax, and then the abdomen is larger. And then if we look at our cockroach, you can see there's the head, but the thorax and abdomen are going to be broadly joined. And then these also, if you were to flip them over, you would discover that these actually have chewing mouth parts, unlike the bed bugs with the piercing sucking mouth parts. And cockroaches, again, if they're outdoor species coming inside, if you can exclude them to actually keep them outside, but if they're an indoor species, then you can certainly use bait to manage them. And if you want um, more information on cockroaches, I'll give you a site to go to later on. So another, <clears throat> excuse me, another insect on the left here, we have uh, small insects that are called book lice. And these, these aren't actual lice, they actually feed on starchy materials. But these are going to have very long, thin antennae, which bed bugs do not have such long antennae. They also have chewing mouth parts. And these are generally lighter in color than the bed bugs, and their bodies tend to be more streamlined or elongated than a bed bug shape. And then on the right, we have another beetle. These are beetles. I love these beetles. We used to rear these when I was in graduate or in undergraduate school. And these are the spider beetles. They, again, chewing mouth parts. They have chewing mouth parts. And they are going to have kind of a, a globular body shape. And they are also, since they are a beetle, they're going to have a hardened front wing that is an elytra and it's going to be smooth. And these, depending on what one you're dealing with, can be uh, variable in color. So the other ones um, on the left here, we have a tick. This, this can be very easy for you to tell apart from a bed bug if you count legs. So the very, very first stage of some ticks are going to only have six legs, but the other stages are all going to have eight legs. These do not have any antenna, and these are only going to have two body regions instead of three. So these are going to be arachnids, whereas the bed bugs are insects. So you can tell them apart by eight legs, 
two body regions, no antenna. The one on the right, the picture over here, this is where things get tricky and you're going to probably really need to get somebody who knows what they're doing. So in some parts of the United States, people can come across bat bugs. And if you have a bat infestation in your attic or someplace like that, you can have bat bugs moving down into the structure. And if you find them, they can be mistaken for bed bugs because they look very, very similar. So the bed bug picture is going to be up here on the top and the bat bug is going to be down here on the bottom. Oh, let me go back. But if you look at the bed bug, you're going to look here on the thorax area and you're going to look at these hairs. And on a bed bug, those hairs are going to be much shorter than on a bat bug. And I know everybody is probably groaning because it's like, well, how how short is short and how long is long. This is why I say you might need to get somebody who really has been exposed to this and knows what they're dealing with because if you have either bed bugs to compare them to or you've had a lot of experience identifying things like bed bugs or bat bugs, then you tend to be able to look at them and say, yes, this is a bat bug versus a bed bug because you kind of have it in your brain how long those hairs are and how they normally are on a bed bug. So this one is usually the one that gets confusing, um, in my opinion, for people, and you need to get it underneath a microscope or a good hand lens to figure out which one you actually have. So if you want more information on bed bugs, then there are two webinars that have been done in previous years. And then we also have a couple of webinars that are on ticks. So if you're looking for more information on any of those topics, you can go and search the older uh, all good, all bugs, good and bad webinars from previous years, and you can find some more information there. All right, cockroaches. Um, as I said previously, cockroaches can be mistaken for bed bugs, especially when they are in the immature form. And you can see up here, here's the same picture that I used. But when we're looking at cockroaches, they are going to have three body regions. They have a head, a thorax, the abdomen. They're going to have long antennae. The adults are usually going to have wings. It's not always, but usually. Um, some of them will also have reduced wings and their legs are going to be meant for running. They are called cursorial legs and they are specialized for running. And then cockroaches are also going to have chewing mouth parts. They are omnivorous and they're scavengers and they're pretty much gonna eat whatever they can find, which is one of the reasons that cockroaches are pretty successful with their life. So mistaken identity for cockroaches, we have in the upper left-hand corner a cricket and I, I have a hard time figuring out why people mistake crickets for cockroaches, but it happens. Uh, crickets are going to have an elongated body. They're going to have their hind legs modified for jumping. If you look at this cricket picture, you can see this big old femur here that they can use to powerfully jump to a new location. And then they're also going to have these really long circe coming off the tip of their abdomen. The next one that is confusing for people tends to be ground beetles. And I guess because these walk across the ground and sometimes they can come indoors, people get confused by them. These do not have long, long antennae like the cockroaches do. And also they're gonna have those wings. So if you look at that front wing, it is hardened and kind of creates a shell over the hind wing. So it has that elytra. So that is going to be a beetle and not a cockroach. Whereas the cockroaches are gonna have more kind of a leathery or greasy looking wing. And then the one on the right is a giant water bug. And these are typically going to be found in aquatic environments, but sometimes people come across them because they will sometimes fly to lights 
especially if you are near water and that light is near water. So if you happen to live next to a lake or a river or something and you have a porch light on, sometimes you will get these flying to your porch light and they may find their way inside. But if you look at these, their front legs are modified for grabbing stuff. These are predaceous and they are going to feed on other insects and things that they find in the water. And so those legs are modified to help them do that. And then if you look at the back legs, they actually are modified for swimming. So they have little hairs and stuff for that. They are also going to have this triangle shape on their back if they are adults and have fully developed wings. The immatures will not have that triangle. And then they're going to have piercing sucking mouth parts. So if you flip them over, instead of having chewing mouth parts with mandibles, they will have a straw-like mouth part that they use to stab into their prey. Okay, so if you want more information about cockroaches, there are some all bugs, good and bad webinars that have been done previously that are specifically on cockroaches or cockroaches and ants, I think was one of them. So you could go into previous years and get more information on cockroaches. All right, moving on to the flies. So I have broken the flies into small flies and large flies. And when we are dealing with flies, the flies are going to only have two wings. So most adult insects that have wings are going to have four wings. But when we're talking about flies, they're only going to have two wings. And their mouth parts can be varied depending upon how they actually feed in their biology. So the first small fly that I want to talk about are the drain flies and moth flies. So it's essentially the same insect, but people call it different things. They call them drain flies because they typically come out of drains and they're called moth flies because they look like little tiny moths. So two wings here, their body is going to be hairy and their wings are kind of covered with hairs and scales. And these do not fly around like you think of a house fly flying around these have more kind of short hopping flights. So it's kind of like a little, I guess a puddle jumper plane that's going from island to island. They kind of have this hopping flight pattern that they use. The next small fly is a fruit fly. And these are usually gonna be a brown to black color. And usually they're gonna have red eyes. Um, not always, but usually the ones that I deal with with people having problems with, they're going to have those bright red eyes. The next one is going to be the fungus gnats, and these are going to be dark in color. They are going to have these really long legs, as you can see here, and they're also going to have fairly long antennae. Um, again, two wings here, and these are going to have a elongated body and they are attracted to lights. And a lot of times you will find these around potted plants because that is where their larvae are going to be living and those fungus gnats will be emerging from uh, potted plants that have been over water. All right, so the next one is known as a scuttle fly, a forward fly, or a humpbacked fly. And these are going to be usually a kind of a light brown to a dark brownish black color. And you can see that they have this humpback shape on them. And they tend to run around more than actually fly. And that's one of the questions that I ask people. So when we're dealing with small flies, Usually the mistaken identity isn't with another order of insects. Usually with the small flies, it's within the group of each other. So knowing what type of fly that you have gives you an idea of where to look for the source so you can get rid of the problem. So with moth and drain flies, they're going to be in drains. With fruit flies, they're typically going to be in overripe produce or vegetation. Fungus gnats are going to be coming out of overwatered planting material. And then scuttle flies are going to be in usually organic um, kind of decaying stuff. So if you kind of know which one you're dealing with, it gives you a better idea of where to look so you can take care of the problem. 
The large flies, again, two wings, variable mouth parts, but the ones that I'm talking about today are gonna to have sponging mouth parts. So the first one is going to be a blowfly. And these tend to be similar looking to house flies. It's kind of the same size and shape and body layout as house flies. But these are usually going to be a metallic color. And you see the one there is kind of a bluish green. There's also ones that are copper in color, one that's more bronze, and then one's kind of a shiny black. And then here is the one that probably people are most familiar with. This is the house fly. And these are going to be light gray in color, and they are going to have four black stripes on their thorax. So right there behind the head, they're gonna have those stripes along that area. And then this one up here, is a flesh fly. And you can see that it looks pretty similar to a house fly. So it's gray, it has those black stripes. But this one, if you look closely, has a red tip on the abdomen. And there are other flesh flies. A lot of them tend to be, in my opinion, hairier than house flies. They have kind of thicker, bristly hair on their body. And very similar to the small flies, it isn't that these are being mistaken for other things sometimes it's that they're being mistaken for one another and depending upon what one you're having you may need to look in different areas so usually with house flies you're going to look at decaying vegetation garbage areas recycling areas um, sometimes trash um, and then with the flesh flies and blow flies you not only have to take those things into account but you may also, if you have these inside a structure, have a dead animal in the attic or in a wall void or underneath the house in a crawl space. So a lot of times I, I get calls on people that they talk about having hundreds of flies emerging in their house and what's going on. And that usually is that there is something that has died in the wall void and once they either get rid of the dead animal or they let the flies cycle through and do their thing, they will go away on their own. So we do have some things that tend to be mistaken that are to do with flies. The first one is a beneficial. And the call that I usually get on this is from a weird housefly flying around. And when I start asking them questions, usually the first thing I ask is about the abdomen. So if you have a small, black, weird housefly, you're gonna look for this little flag-like abdomen. And if you have that, it's not a housefly, it's going to be an ensign wasp. And these are gonna have long antennae, whereas the houseflies are gonna have short antennae, that flag-like abdomen. And these are actually parasitoids of cockroach egg cases. They will lay their eggs in the egg case of cockroaches. And when their egg hatches out, it will actually eat the developing cockroaches. So these are great to have around to help you with the cockroach problem. And if you see them inside your house, that means that you need to do something about the cockroaches, not the instant flies. The next one I get is about maggots. Usually people refer to these as small white worms. These are not worms, they are a type of larvae. And with maggots, they are gonna be that creamy white shape and they are going to be carrot shaped or tapered. So they're kind of blunt on one end and then pointed on the other end. And they can be various sizes depending on what stage they're in. And then the last call that I get, these are usually referred to as mats that build up on people's windowsills at some times of the year. And these are gonna be psyllids. This particular one here is known as a hackberry psyllid. These are going to have four wings, not two, and their wings are going to be held tent-like over the back of the body. And when I say tent-like, I mean like a two-man cup tent that is a triangle shape, not like the big fancy glamping Tents. If you look closely at the psyllids, you would notice that they have piercing sucking mouth parts instead of uh, sponging mouth parts or something like some of the flies. 
So if you want more information about flies, there is a webinar from last year that I did that tells you way more about flies and how to manage not only flies in your house, but also in the environment around it. All right, ants versus termites. These are going to be, this is like a huge portion, especially in the springtime here in Texas, because that's usually when these start swarming and getting really active. So the stage of ants and termites that we're talking about are known as the reproductives or the swarmers. And these are the ones that typically will have wings. So when we look, we have our ant on the left-hand side of the slide and the termite is on the right. So the first thing to look for are the antennae. On ants, the antennae are typically going to be elbowed, which essentially means that they're bent kind of in an L shape. For termites, they are going to have straight antennae, and they look kind of like little um, beads put together. Next thing to look for is the waist. On ants, you are going to have a pinched or narrowed waist that is constricted between the thorax and the abdomen there. And then on the termite, that area is going to be broadly joined. And the last thing that you can look for are the wings. If they actually still have the wings on, for ants, those wings are going to be unequal in size. The front wings are going to be larger than the hind wings are. Whereas if you look at the termites, those wings are equal in size and shape. And just to give you an idea of what they actually look like, um, not always do you find them with wings because once they come back down from the mating flight, a lot of times they will shed their wings in both the termite form, as you see here, and in the ant form, as you see here. And I'm not going into telling ants apart because that could be, as you can see, many other presentations. So if you want to learn more about termites, there are old all books bugs good and bad webinars that you can go search for as well as a variety of them on different types of ants including uh, fire ants, Argentine ants, and others. Venomous spiders. The spider questions that I usually get are um, usually what they ask is what is the spider but what they actually should be asking is is this spider venomous or is this spider a recluse spider or a widow spider? Because that's actually what they want to know. So the recluse spider is going to be on the left, the widow on the right. So the recluse is going to have that violin or fiddle shaped marking on the cephalothorax. But the, there are other spiders that have kind of similar markings to that. Recluse spiders are also going to have a uniform color throughout their body and including their legs. But when you look at them up close, you need to look for the three pair of eyes on that leading edge of the cephalothorax. Most people don't want to get close enough to the spider to actually check out the eye pattern. So what we recommend is that they put out sticky traps and they can leave them in place for a week or two and then they can bring those into their area extension office to have them looked at and we can uh, do that in a safe manner then. So widow spiders, that's going to be on the right hand side and these are going to have in the female stage uh, that large bulbous abdomen. The, the male abdomen is not as large as the females. And then they're going to have that red hourglass on the underside of the abdomen. And this, um, this one is a southern black widow that you see in this particular photo here. But there are other uh, types of spiders, other widow spiders in the United States. Um, the western widow, the northern widow. Um, we also have brown widows. This is what a brown widow looks like. It's more of a mottled color but you see that it still has that hourglass on the underside. So mistaken identity for recluse spiders. We have over here on the left, a spitting spider. It does have the three pair of eyes on the front part of the head, but it does not have a violin pattern and the body is a mottled brown, not a uniform brown color. 
in the middle, we have a southern house spider, and this one is a female, the one on the bottom, and then the one on the top is the right, or the, the male. And the male is typically the one that is confused for a recluse. So again, you can see there's no violin shape. The male have these elongated palps, and the eye pattern is also different here. And then on the right-hand side, we have a wolf spider. Again, no violin pattern. These are kind of a, a hairier spider than the recluse, and these are gonna have eight eyes instead of six. And then widow spider, mistaken identity here is essentially everything. <laughs> if it has a pudgy abdomen, people tend to think that it is a widow spider. And you know, there are a lot of uh, orb weavers out there, which is what a lot of these are gonna be in here. And you can see that they do not have that red hourglass on the underside of their abdomen. Um, I'm not saying that all widows have the hourglass because the hourglass can be reduced sometimes into spots. Um, so if you are concerned about the widow spiders or the recluse spiders, if you are cleaning in the attic or in your garage or outdoors or whatever, wear work gloves on your hands so when you're reaching in to areas, you don't get bitten by these spiders. So if you want more information on the spiders, there is a great webinar that was done a couple years ago on spiders. And then there's also the spider website that you see there that has lots of information. Brown marmorated stink bugs. These aren't a terrible, terrible problem in Texas yet, but I know that my family that lives in Ohio have issues with these. So to tell a brown marmorated stink bug, they are going to have antennae that have white and black bands. So you can see these white bands here and then the black bands there. They are also going to have this area right here, which is on the thorax. They are naming those shoulders. They have smooth shoulders. And then they're also going to have this black and white pattern here along the abdomen. So mistaken identity, here's our brown marmorated stink bug up at the top right. We have a spined soldier bug. If you look here, they do not have the smooth soldier or the smooth so shoulders. They have spiky ones and they don't have the stripes on the antenna. The next one is a brown stink bug. And again, no stripe on the antenna here. And then the abdomen around there does not have that black and white pattern like you see with the brown marmorated. And then the last one that we typically get around here is known as a rough stink bug. And these are a mottled gray and brown color. Again, their antennae do not have those stripes on them and their abdomen does not have the black and white striping pattern. All right, stored product moths. These are some that if somebody finds a small moth inside, they kind of get them mistaken as to what they may be because they can be clothes moths or they can be Indian meal moths or there are some other ones that they can be too. Uh, but these are the common ones. So Indian meal moth, you see on the left, and these are going to have three quarters of an inch wingspan. So these are going to be larger in size typically than our clothes moths, which are only going to have half an inch for their wingspan. The Indian mule moth, they are going to have tan wings, but they have this copper tip on them. And when they fold their wings at the, uh, over their back, you can actually see that nice patch of copper color. The adults typically fly at night and they are attracted to light. So you may see these flying around. And while they typically get into uh, stored plant products, they can be in other areas than the kitchen and pantry area because they can infest things like dog food or bird seed or um, sometimes if they're in a bathroom area, people have a rice pack that they use for heating and kind of soothing sore muscles. It just depends what you have stored in those areas. The clothes moths, on the other hand, are smaller. They're kind of a creamy tan color. And these have hairs on top of their head. 
when I was in school, we called these the Don King moths because they have these um, real spiky, hairy heads. And that was just kind of how you remembered what they were. And these will tend to avoid light, whereas the Indian meal moths are attracted to light. And the clothes moths are going to feed on clothing. So they are typically going to be in areas where clothing is stored, such as closets or um, cedar chests or things like that. So if you want more information on stored products, there is a previous webinar that has covered this whole entire topic. So please feel free to watch that. Mites. This one is a tough one. And the example that I have here are bird mites, but there can also be rodent mites. And usually when these come into structures is because there is a bird problem or a rat problem or mouse problem or something. So you either have rodents or you have birds. And those could be nesting in attics or chimneys or crawl spaces or whatever. And they can venture into the structure and they can you know, be discovered on sticky traps or they can possibly cause biting sensations and stuff. So things that are commonly confused with the mites are book lice, which we talked about previously because sometimes people think these are bed bugs. And the other one are going to be springtails. If you have issues with either book lice or springtails, it's typically because there is some sort of moisture problem in your house. And if you will put in a dehumidifier or adjust the thermostat to get rid of that humidity, then usually those insects are either going to die or they're going to go someplace that is a better habitat for them to live. So this is the other stuff that we will get sometimes. And people are wondering what bugs they have in this particular sample. So in this one, I think that circled area is like maybe two thirds of an ant. It's not the whole entire thing. It's missing some body parts. But the rest of it is hair and dirt and debris and lint and different things like that. So when we're looking at an arthropod, arthropods are going to have an exoskeleton, which means that their bones are on the outside of their body. They have segmented bodies. They have jointed appendages. And they are going to have bilateral symmetry, which means that if you cut them up and down lengthwise, the left and the right hand sides are going to match up. They are a mirror image of one another. And so you can kind of look at things and say, hey, that is an arthropod or that's dirt or lint. Um, you may need a good hand lens or something like that. But as always, if you have questions, please feel free to contact your local extension office. And that is the end uh, that kind of leads us into the, the next webinar. And I will turn it over here. Thank you, Wizzy. That was great. Anyone, do y'all have any questions to ask? You can type them in the chat box or the, the Q&A at the bottom. Now I know someone has a question. If you don't, I'm going to go ahead and launch these poll questions up there. There we go. So, Wizzy, while, while these poll questions are being answered, oh, wait, we have a few questions. And it says, it's from, it says, will you list the websites for the previous webinars after this? Uh, yes. Vicki, is there any way that you could put the, just the link to the, well, to this year's webinar? It links to all of them, and they're all on YouTube. And they're all available and on the website for you to watch. So, and this one will be on, um, it will be uploaded probably like next week, right? And then they can go in. This one, yes, this one will be uploaded by Monday. Let's 
see anybody else. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. So, Wizzy, you're getting some thank yous for the thank for this you. webinar. Anyone else have any questions? If not, we hope to see you next month for another exciting topic on mice, scabies, and mites. Everybody, y'all have a great weekend, and Wizzy, thank you so much for doing this today. Thank you, Danny. I appreciate it.